Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, from wherever you're tuning in today. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us this, this afternoon, this morning, this evening for our presentation. Uh, my name is Brendan Tugger, and I am the Product Manager for Protected Seas uh, Marine Monitor, also known as M2. Uh, our objective for today's satellite activity is to showcase our shore-based radar vessel monitoring platform for consideration as an ocean decade program. I will kick things off this morning with a brief background on why we think M2 should be considered as an ocean program. Uh, and then I'll pass the mic on to my colleague, Samantha Cope, who is our data application specialist for M2. Sam will be diving a little deeper into our technology and how it can be a useful tool for marine resource managers around the world. She will also provide a brief overview of the M2 viewer, which is how users interact with data collected from our platform. From there, we'll be showing a mini documentary on M2, which includes some of the places we currently are working and showcases some of our partners and experiences they have using our technology in the field. Finally, we'll, we will conclude our presentation with a Q&A session. Uh, as for some housekeeping, please note that if you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them to the Q&A section. You can do this by selecting the Q&A button at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Also, please note that today's presentation will be recorded and available with closed captioning uh, and translations after the presentation via our Marine Monitor YouTube channel. <clears throat> we believe that M2 should be considered as an ocean program, uh, decade program, because M2 provides resource managers with an accessible tool for monitoring and reporting on vessel activity in coastal areas, which can be utilized anywhere in the world. M2 provides skills, knowledge, and technology for all and helps site partners working to protect and restore ecosystems and promote biodiversity. Ongoing M2 deployments across the world's oceans offer tangible opportunities for sharing and expanding the network of stakeholders engaged with the ocean decade. M2 already has a global presence with 14 active M2 sites operating today and additional ongoing deployments that are either in progress or in the planning stages. A number of these locations include small island developing states designated by the United Nations. M2 is a program of Protected Seas, which is a privately funded California-based organization that is focused on long-term conservation technology solutions for both marine conservation and management. We started M2 in 20, 000, 2015 and have a small interdisciplinary team that has extensive experience working in marine conservation science and technology. Over the last seven years, we've deployed over 20 systems in seven countries and continue to increase our global presence with new deployments each year. We actively work with local governments, communities, NGOs, law enforcement, government agencies, and academia to expand our reach. With that brief introduction, I will pass the presentation on to my colleague, Samantha Cope, who will speak more about why we developed them too, and how we think it can play a role in effective management of marine resources. Hi, everyone. So marine protected areas, or MPAs, have been increasing in number and size thanks to their positive influence on ocean conservation. But for MPAs to be effective, it is essential that the regulations put in place are monitored and enforced. It is estimated that around 95% of the global fishing fleet do not share their location using the automatic identification system or vessel monitoring systems which makes vessels near MPAs difficult to monitor. Ultimately, limited budget capacity hinders monitoring and enforcement, and this is especially pronounced in developing states. For MPAs to meet their protection goals, monitoring is key. An M2 is a cost-effective solution for monitoring activity in nearshore MPAs or other sensitive areas. M2 uses commercial off-the-shelf marine radar to track vessels regardless of their participation in AIS or VMS. M2 software captures tracking data from the radar system, sends it to the cloud, and makes it available in a simple interface for remote access for anyone with an internet connection. Live data provide active situational awareness from anywhere, and historical data can help inform future enforcement efforts by showing activity patterns over time. So M2 was originally designed to support enforcement efforts, 
and it provides a method for documenting activity. So there are a number of other applications where M2 has been useful, such as data collection tools for researchers interested in human impacts on marine areas and species at risk. The issue of vessel strikes to whales and underwater noise pollution are two topics that M2 has been used to inform. And the weather station on board provides additional data points from the field. Finally, M2 is another tool that managers can use to multiply their eyes on the water. In one instance, M2 was used to monitor a container ship that had suffered a fire on board and was actually drifting toward oil platforms off the coast of California. M2 provided live monitoring while response vessels made their way to the scene. And users can always be sure that data are encrypted and secure. For sites with power and internet access, the compact M2 system can be easily integrated into the infrastructure that already exists, like a ranger station or an office. In this example, the M2 control center is housed in a rugged box, and the radar antenna and the camera have been installed on the roof of a previously existing building. For more remote areas that might not have power and internet, the mobile marine monitor, or what we call M3, can go fully off-grid. A commercial marine radar system monitors vessel activity from shore out to about five nautical miles. This is the same type of radar system you might have on a medium or smaller sized boat for navigation. And the pan tilt camera is directed to vessel locations by the radar system. A weather station provides an environmental context and valuable data from remote locations. And an AIS sensor is included to record any larger vessels that transmit these data in the area. Monitoring in remote areas is accomplished by outfitting M2 systems on towable trailers with a solar array, battery system, and cellular or microwave antenna. The trailer design is rapidly deployable and movable since monitoring needs could change over time. It also can provide a base of operations for teams operating in the field. The radar systems used by M2 are similar to those used by boats but M2 systems are typically deployed along the coast and the radar tracks nearby vessels. In this example, you can see the traditional red radar imagery. Most of what you see in red is land, but you can also see the location of a vessel on the water. M2 software uses the vessel positions from the radar system to construct vessel tracks showing activity over time. These tracks are presented in an online platform called the M2 Viewer. And now we're going to play a brief video for you so we can show you the M2 Viewer in action. The Marine Monitor system collects data from the field and makes it available in a user-friendly, browser-based interface called the M2 Viewer. The viewer can be accessed both on-site and anywhere with an internet connection, simply by visiting m2.protectedseas.net, where anyone can sign up for an account. New users are verified by the M2 team and site partners. In the map on the right, the location of the M2 system is notated by the radar icon. The blue polygon indicates the expected range of radar tracking. This range may fluctuate based on conditions at the site and the size and type of vessels. Red and black polygons identify areas of interest, like marine protected areas or management zones. Red areas indicate active alarm zones that have been configured to identify particular activities, such as fishing. Users can sign up to receive alerts when vessels trigger an alarm. Common map features include zoom, scale, and other map layers, including satellite imagery. The raw radar layer overlays the radar imagery on the map. Marine radar is designed to identify solid objects on the water's surface. So vessels, land, and other features will be visible in this imagery. It is recommended to turn on this layer when interpreting data. The timeline feature allows users to replay past activity. 
On the left is the track table. By clicking on a track record, tracks are then shown on the map. Each record has a unique identification number. Track data received from the Automatic Identification System, or AIS, are numbered using their unique identity. Most AIS vessels can also be viewed on the Marine Traffic website for additional information. The track table also contains helpful information on the vessel's activity, including when it was active, its speed, distance traveled, and if it triggered an active alarm zone. Track photos are viewed by clicking the camera icon. The numbers on the map correspond to where the vessel was located when the photo was taken. Clicking the tag icon opens the tagging window. This allows users to identify vessels and activities, leave notes, and upload any additional photos that were taken in the field. The target confidence score helps users identify which track records reflect a true vessel's path. Even though marine radar is configured to detect vessels, occasionally breaking waves, high swell, and storm activity can be tracked by the system. The radar imagery is helpful for providing context. Vessels are typically well-defined, while rough seas and rain appear noisy. M2 uses a model developed by machine learning to score tracks. Confidence scores closer to one indicate tracks likely to be vessels, while scores closer to zero are those likely to be false targets. Users can click the Generate Report button to create a custom summary of the activity they're currently viewing. The M2 viewer has two view modes. Historical track records are viewed in playback mode, and users can utilize an extensive filter menu to narrow their search, like setting a date and time range, and a number of track attributes like speed and distance traveled. It's important to note that in playback mode, tracks with low confidence scores, which are those likely to be false targets, are hidden by default, but users can change this in the filter menu. Switching to live mode, and the map and track table look very similar. But in live mode, the arrow icons show the most current location of the vessels. Right-click on the arrow to see the latitude and longitude of the current position. Green arrows indicate a vessel has not entered an alarm zone. Yellow indicates the vessel entered a zone, and red confirms that it's triggered the alarm. Current weather conditions are also available in live mode if the M2 site has been outfitted with a weather station. Users with access to more than one M2 site can also easily switch between sites using the drop-down menu. Finally, use the gears icon in the top right corner of the map to access the settings menu. This includes a dashboard of system functioning, options for managing notifications, access to data downloads, and documentation and manuals. The M2 viewer is an easy-to-use, interactive platform that provides users with the capacity to monitor marine areas from anywhere, supporting local management and 24-7 maritime domain awareness. Okay, next we're going to move into our 18-minute documentary showcasing M2 and how it's being used around the world. After the video, we'll be answering any questions you have, so remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Enjoy. Marine monitor systems have been deployed across the world's oceans to provide affordable and accessible technology for managing human activity in marine areas. Specifically designed to help fill existing gaps in both knowledge and access to resources, M2 has been a successful solution proven in the field since 2015. To date, Marine Monitor has been deployed in over 20 locations in seven countries and has been deployed in a variety of different applications 
Uh, we've deployed systems on remote islands here in California, as well as in places like Palau, Ecuador, and American Samoa. And we've also deployed systems in heavily populated areas, such as uh, La Jolla, um, and a crowded beachfront property. To get the M2 radar installed at our Marine Safety Center, uh, we created a memorandum of understanding between the city and protected seas and Wild Coast. Um, all who had the interest of putting a marine radar here at the Swami's SMCA. And we took that to council with the recommendation that they approve the memorandum of understanding and our council approved it. And as soon as that got approved, we got ready to install the M2 radar at Moonlight State Beach. M2 brings together traditional tools like marine radar and cameras to provide a familiar method for monitoring vessels on the water. Repurposing these common technologies supports rapid deployment and training. M2 integrates these tools with custom software and AI to autonomously record and report on activity detected by the system 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Monitoring vessel activity has a number of applications, such as fisheries management, enforcement of regulations, and measuring human impact on sensitive marine protected areas, or MPAs. While industrial fishing fleets and commercial ships commonly share their locations, smaller vessels, like recreational fishing boats, may go undetected. M2 helps further our understanding of these activities. So the M2 radar is important to us as Marine Safety Division. It helps us in tracking and assisting local agencies with enforcing these state and federal regulations on both private and uh, commercial fishing vessels. That also allows us to kind of track activity throughout our operational area throughout different seasons. As you know, we have lobster season that we track and this area becomes a very popular spot being on the edge of an MPA. So we can actually utilize the radar to track how much activity we're seeing in a certain time of year and help us not only plan what staff we need to help mitigate any situations, but which days are going to be busiest and as managers of the speech, how we can fully staff and help serve any of the community that comes to us. M2 empowers managers with data they can combine with expert local knowledge. In this way, they can use technology at an appropriate scale to support decision-making related to fisheries and human activity in general. NOAA's Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation use Marine Monitor to better understand human activity and also vessel use within nearshore areas of interest, both in marine protected areas and also within NOAA's Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And Marine Monitor is really important and really helpful for the sanctuary and managers throughout the state since Marine Monitor allows us to understand what vessels are doing in these near shore areas that don't otherwise have a tracking system or data coming from them. Uh, there are a lot of fisheries in California that don't require certain tracking devices within the fishery and so Marine Monitor allows us to fill this really crucial data gap to understand what human use is looking like within these important protected areas and also if there's any suspicious fishing activity happening in certain areas where it shouldn't be. To meet global conservation goals, it is essential that regulations put into place to protect and preserve marine ecosystems are enforced. M2 is a tool that can support existing enforcement by monitoring compliance and highlighting activity of interest, ultimately providing additional eyes on the water. Global conservation combines the the radar system with patrol support, uh, smart technology, which is um, keeping track of all the patrols, allowing better planning, incident reporting, um, and really uh, giving the managers of an MPA uh, a set of systems and tools that they can use to do better protection uh, and be more cost effective. A lot of uh, marine protection is just hours and hours and days of, of driving boats and that is not a way to protect uh, MPA. It wastes gas, it wastes uh, maintenance on boats and um, really what you want to do is do targeted interdictions based on uh, either uh, volunteer reports from the community, uh, from NGOs uh, with binoculars, or sophisticated tools like uh, marine radar 
and the protected C software, which creates a virtual fence around the MPA. You see all traffic coming in and out, and they use uh, uh, artificial intelligence to, to manage the data so that it, only the most important alerts, i.e. an illegal uh, uh, phishing is happening inside the MPA. And that is a very powerful system and very easy to use for MPA managers. Global Conservation supports the Protected Seas program to roll out marine radars uh, across uh, no-take areas, endangered uh, marine protected areas, both in California, Hawaii, and uh, six countries now. Uh, places like uh, Ternefe Atoll in Belize, uh, Isla de la Plata in Ecuador. Uh, these are really important uh, marine protected areas. It was Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation work in partnership with the Protected Seas team to manage a site on the west side of Santa Cruz Island at Christie Ranch. Um, that site is completely remote. It's actually an M3 system, so it's powered by solar panels, also includes an AIS receiver, and gives us coverage within roughly five nautical miles of its location at Santa Cruz Island, and also gives us data from marine protected areas on and near Santa Rosa Island. The locations that we're trying to monitor are often remote and hard to access. And so as a result, we've had to create solutions to enable ourselves to be able to deploy our technology to remote, hard to reach places. We developed the Mobile Marine Monitor, or M3, which is a trailerized portable system that incorporates an off-grid power system with a telescoping mast that houses our radar antenna and camera. These systems are transportable anywhere in the world and are currently active in four countries with more to come in the future. As we travel further south to Mexico, uh, and we have partners uh, Predator and Noreste who have also been early adopters of our technology. Okay, we work right now in about eight states um, in the whole Northwest, but the radars of the MC system are placed right now in Baja California Sur, in Loreto, and in Cabo Pulmo, which has, are like very touristic places to meet. So, we are, we are very few rangers, so this helps us to identify ships in, uh, without being there physically. And everyone that has like the internet can be like watching what's going on. Yes, uh, here, uh, yes. In, uh, the... in Cabo Pulmo, they cannot do anything but tourism. They cannot do any kind of fishing. So we know if, if it's in the middle of the night, it's not gonna be tourism because they are not allowed to. Our valued partners who were early adopters of this technology in California and Mexico have helped us to further develop today's M2 and M3 systems. Now the Marine Monitor is at work in Ecuador and the Northern Reefs of Palau. My name is Junior Tamon and uh, I am um, our Long State Division of Conservation and Law Enforcement Coordinator. Um, our Long is uh, 197 uh, square kilometers marine area and uh, about 42 square kilometers of it is uh, protected areas. The main threats we face today as uh, enforcement officers for uh, our long DCLE is uh, mainly poachers, as well as uh, effects of climate change. With a partnership of One Reef, we uh, had a, an M2 uh, radar, and um, it's a very good tool to use.
Ocean is a data poor environment and any piece of information that we can produce regarding the ocean and human use around it is valuable. So what we have done is created a tool to collect that data and provide deeper understanding in how the marine environment is being used, which then can in inform decision makers like resource managers or law enforcement on how to best manage and protect these special places. In December of 2020, Fish and Wildlife Officers patrolling Swami's State Marine Conservation Area approached the commercial passenger fishing vessel, Electra. The passengers were observed to be illegally fishing inside the MPA. The Electra's owner was cited, prosecuted, and successfully convicted. The case was solidified with further documentation of the vessel's presence in the MPA via the shore-based radar marine monitor vessel tracking system. In dealing with the electric case, my partner was fairly small, being um, the on-duty supervisor the day that Fish and Wildlife made their bus and issued their citations. I was able to access all the footage and tracking data from the M2 radar, and I was able to provide photos of Fish and Wildlife actually interacting with the electric vessel in the MPA. That mixed in with the GPS coordinates of everything that M2 provides them they were able to use that as evidence in their case against the Electra. There's hundreds of marine protected areas being established uh, by different organizations and governments, but very little resources or technology uh, or organizational uh, capacity uh, given to these uh, marine protected areas to actually protect them. So what uh, Protected Seas is, is actually putting the P, capital P, into protection for uh, marine protected areas. It's such an important role. It's a very low cost technology. Technology is becoming a key component of monitoring the ocean, and it is important that the scale is appropriate for managers to use effectively. At the local level, M2 provides an affordable tool without compromising available benefits from existing and new technologies. So M2 will adapt and incorporate new technological developments as the fleet of M2 systems continues to grow worldwide. We first developed Marine Monitor as a tool to better manage and enforce marine protected areas. But over time, we've realized that there are other applications and use, use cases for our technology. For example, the U.S. Coast Guard can use it for search and rescue efforts. The Department of Homeland Security can use it for uh, drug smuggling or human trafficking. And uh, science and research can use it for to better understand how the marine environment is being used. Um, one interesting example is the data that we've collected has informed how vessels are actually following regulations correctly and fishing close to the marine protected area. The reason for this is likely because the increased biodiversity and biomass of these areas has resulted in an increase in number of fish in the protected area. And as a result, there's the spillover effect or more fish to be fished around the borders. With our system, we've been able to monitor this activity and actually see how these vessels are fishing the line um, and, and benefiting from the protection of this natural resource. Weather stations are also integrated with M2. Weather data provide context for vessel activity, allow users to monitor live conditions for maritime safety, and are a valuable data point in remote locations. M2 expands our understanding of activity and human impact in hard to monitor areas with low impact on the ground and minimal resources, ideal for managing sensitive areas. For Encinitas, the residents and the visitors here are really in tune with the marine ecosystem. Um, I feel they have a deep connection to the coastline here and really desire uh, it, uh, a healthy marine ecosystem. So uh, supporting the um, MPA with the M2 radar is a high priority for the residents, visitors, and our council city. Local M2 systems benefit from the power of cloud computing. In this age of big data, M2 uses machine learning to help point users to important activity so they can quickly find meaning in the data collected, also making M2 a powerful tool for analysis and data interpretation. So much of conservation work is driven by uh, data and needs to be driven by data in order to protect 
marine protected areas and marine regions. We need to understand trends and what's, what's happening. We need to understand the scale and the nature of the problems that exist in those areas. And the marine monitor systems give us the ability to get better data to fill those data gaps that currently exist for resource managers within California and other areas globally. So we can actually understand and quantify vessel activity in places where we normally wouldn't get data. With vital ocean protections in place and expanding, we aim to make conservation technology more accessible and equitable throughout the world with the help of Marine Monitor. It can be difficult to introduce new tools and new technologies into resource managers' worlds and have them integrate new tools into their protocols and their procedures. With the Marine Monitor system, it's been incredibly helpful that the site and the viewer that comes with Marine Monitor is incredibly intuitive. Uh, it's really allowed the wardens that we work very closely with within California to be able to feel comfortable logging in and not just visualizing data, but also being able to download data if they'd like to, to do further analyses. The big problem is, uh, is that we don't have any fish left and the sharks are all being killed. The manta rays and the rays are all being taken. Uh, uh, we're setting up MPAs and there's no fish in the MPAs. So these are being wiped out. The entire Caribbean is gone. We, there, I haven't, can't find a place other than Cuba where we can actually protect any intact marine ecosystems. So what we're really looking to do is, is find the best uh, marine protected area managers, the best uh, places that can take, uh, uh, can do the monitoring, surveillance and patrolling now. Most of the MPAs are empty, there's no boats, there's no rangers, and it's just on paper. It's called a paper park. And we wanna change that situation and get real active patrolling based on uh, real information from good technology like a uh, marine monitor, uh, protected seas and communities taking care of their own places. So um, I think that's our, our vision is, is really to get this ramped up to hundreds of endangered marine protected areas in the next 10 years. And we hope that uh, you'll join us. All right, hopefully everybody enjoyed that. We're gonna move on to the question and answer section. Um, and we have a few questions. Uh, remember, if you have any questions during this time, you can submit them during, um, to the Q&A, uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom. Uh, let's see, so Brendan, uh, how much does an M2 system cost typically? And are there funding opportunities? Sure. Uh, great question. And uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending and watching the little documentary put together. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, from the onset of, of M2 and the development of the technologies, we've uh, had a very strong focus on keeping the cost as low and affordable as possible so that we could get our systems in the hands of practitioners around the world um, and resource conservation um, and enable this technology to have a, a greater to roll, roll in conservation. Um, that said, the, it's still can be a little expensive for some groups, but the, the standalone system um, that we have for locations with existing infrastructure, um, so the, the first system that Sh Sam showed during the presentation is it's around $100,000 US dollars. And then the, uh, for sites that don't have power and internet or no infrastructure and are completely remote, the cost is closer to 170,000 US dollars. Um, uh, these, these costs include everything it takes to build and integrate the technology to physically deploying it and getting the system live and running anywhere in the world. So, um, and then additional support to make sure that that data that's being collected, collected is useful um, and support from our team to make sure that the system's operating and working the way we want it to. 
um, as we, we realize that one of the biggest hurdles for a lot of um, conservation groups is the is the, the access to resources, financial resources. And so from the onset, we've, we've been really creative and working with different groups to identify funding opportunities to get this hand, get this technology in the hands of people that can use it. Um, so while the price tag might be uh, high for some groups, we, we always like to mention or keep in mind that um, there are creative ways or other ways that we can work with you to, to find funding and opportunities to to expand where this the system get this system can be deployed. Okay, awesome. Um, uh, who has access to the data? How do you keep it secure? Yeah, good question. So, uh, anyone. Uh, so access to the online um, remonitored data is strictly controlled on a user by user basis um, and it's site by site specific. So whatever partner or customer or organization or group that we're working with, um, they basically determine who has access and who can, who can use the data that we're collecting um, and has access to, to do the site uh, both in real time and uh, in, in playback or historical view. Um, this data is all stored offsite in the cloud um, via a secure uh, AWS, AWS server. So um, we do everything in our in our power to make sure that data is protected for those people that want to use it um, and uh, work with our partners to make sure that uh, only those that have access are, ha actually have access. Okay. So how would you handle a system without internet connection, um, without cell phone reception, without, you know, fully in the field in a remote location? Yep, another good question. So while the system was initially designed to have consistent connection to the internet so that you can view real-time data anywhere in the world, um, just via the cloud-based uh, user interface, we have acknowledged that there are some locations where it's maybe impossible to, to actually achieve that communication um, quality that you would you would need um, or just be cost uh, prohibitive. So like the use of satellite um, communications and things of that nature. Uh, so we've designed the system so that everything that's collected, all the data that is collected is um, stored on site and can be downloaded directly from the system um, to another PC or to a USB drive. Um, and that enables users to uh, to access data if the site is, is completely offline. Um, can you share a little bit about um, M2 plans in Malaysia for um, monitoring blast fishing? Yeah, so that's a great question. And also something else we wanted to kind of highlight today was just that, that we're always looking for new technologies and ways to improve the platform and expand the use cases for technology particularly with other technologies that exist. So um, we have a system that is in development um, in Malaysia with uh, partners um, that stop uh, fish blasting, um, stop fish bombing um, in Malaysia. And what we're doing there is we're integrating the, the MG radar system with uh, hydrophone technology so that we can um, direct interdiction or record activity um, and associate tracks with a, a blast fishing uh, attempt. And so with, by incorporating these two different um, technologies, we can increase uh, our understanding of you know, where that boat was coming from, where it was, and then where it's going after the activity. Um, and then that can provide more intel on kind of the, the human behavior uh, around the blast fishing um, activities. Sorry, uh, we have some more questions coming in. Um, so how many of the existing systems that we have, ha approximately, uh, have been requested by government agencies? Uh, I, I guess it, maybe a percentage would be better. Probably um, 10 to 15 percent have been requested by government. Um, and that includes governments in the like, agencies in the United States, but also abroad. Um, so, so depending on where we're working in the country, there's always different hurdles and challenges that we have uh, introducing the technology. And, and one example is that we have a system that we're, we've been trying to deploy in Indonesia for 
a very long time. Um, and the Indonesian government's actually going to be managing that system. And so that's created some additional hurdles. So um, we're learning through that process. But uh, generally speaking, the government is involved in, in, in 10 to 15 percent of the, the systems. Um, but primarily, we're working with local communities, NGOs, um, small community groups that are, are trying to manage a, a resource that's very um, focalized to that area. Um, and then occasionally government will uh, be attracted to that opportunity or that additional data point. And we have a question about systems in Europe. Um, and so we can share that we don't have any active systems in Europe right now. Um, we are, you know, we started in California and we have a number of systems there and some other systems along the West Coast. Some of our other international sites were highlighted in the video, um, but we are always looking to expand and we have just recently deployed systems to Belize um, and we'll be expanding along the US East Coast. So um, nothing in Europe planned yet, um, but we're making moves trying to, to kind of expand the fleet. Um, Brendan, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just generally that we're always looking for new opportunities and in, in groups and partners to work with. Um, there's no opportunity that we, we would shy away from, I guess. And what we do and part of the things that, one of the things that we really specialize in is um, working with partners or potential customer to identify the suitable location for our technology to ensure that it's going to, to perform at the optimal level. And so that process can take, you know, months to years, depending on who we're working with or where we're working. But what that enables us to do is be really confident that once we deploy the system and get it in the field, that it will, will do what we want it to do. Um, kind of in that same vein, um, given COVID and the different restrictions that we've, we've had um, with travel and things of that nature, we're, we're very hands-on uh, with what we do. We, we, we manage the software, but we also manage the hardware and the deployment and the and the infrastructure and work with groups to make sure that everything on the ground is ready to go so that when we get there, we're collecting data immediately. Um, so with COVID kind of restricting that ability, we've, we've proven with systems in Ecuador and, and Belize um, that we can deploy these systems without actually physically going to the location. Oh, sorry, in Malaysia as well. Um, and we can work with partners on the ground and get the systems up and running, um, you know, with the help of WhatsApp and Zoom calls and things like that. Um, which also expands the, the ability to get these systems deployed as well as um, can reduce the costs and, and make it a little bit more affordable for different locations. Okay, um, it doesn't seem like there are any more questions. So um, maybe to wrap up, Brendan, you can share some M2 developments we have in the works for the future. Yeah, sure. So the as previously mentioned with our partners in Malaysia with um, stop uh, fish bombing, um, we are working to integrate our, our technology with other platforms and uh, other groups so that we can kind of create and expand what we, what we know is happening in and around the marine environment. Uh, one of those things that we've worked on for the past couple of years is in integration with a drone system. Um, and we've proven that ability and the ability to autonomously direct a drill into a radar target um, that might be out of the range of our existing cameras. Um, so essentially expanding the, that five nautical mile range that we generally can, can identify and monitor a vessel with a camera. We can now um, expand that range further out with the use of drones. Um, and we're actually de developing that technology in uh, Mexico and hopefully have, have a pilot um, project launching soon with our partner, Pernod Noreste, um, Pernod Tura Noreste. Um, we're also working and looking for opportunities to integrate uh, M2 with VHS systems uh, and other sensor or onboard sensor technologies to identify uh, dark vessels that should otherwise have sensors on board. Um, this type of uh, tool could be particularly beneficial for fishery cooperatives or other fishery management groups that know exactly who should and shouldn't be uh, in their area uh, or their you know, fishing, designated fishing area. And then we're also working with partners in Belize um, and hopefully other locations to integrate M2 with a smart conservation technology to provide <clears throat> a data point for more targeted law enforcement efforts and just more st st strategic engagement, excuse me, with uh, uh, vessels on the water. 
All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you to everyone who worked behind the scenes to make this webinar possible. Um, and a special thank you to our partners worldwide. For any other questions that you uh, may have had or might come up later or to connect with us, you can check out our website or send us an email. Just a reminder, a recording of this presentation and the videos we showed will all be available on our Marine Monitor YouTube channel following this presentation where closed captioning and translations will be available. So thank you everyone. Thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate it. And hopefully we can find some groups to work together and expand where Marine Monitor is on the globe.